Well, just real quick, I'm going to give you an introduction to the authors and then uh, turn it over to them and we'll give them a half an hour each to do their thing and so I'll, I'll be uh, keeping track of the time, I guess, as we go. Um, so we're going to start tonight with, uh, and I'll introduce you both at the beginning. Um, Gerald Horn is a, uh, I'm sorry, Steve Early will go first. So Steve is a longtime union organizer, labor writer. His most recent book is called Save Our Unions, um, Dispatches from a Movement in Distress. Steve is a longtime union representative who has not been shy about being critical when discussing strategies that work and those he sees as less effective. In this recent book, he looks also at uh, minority unions, small groups of rank and file union members who create reform movements inside of their own unions to increase militancy. He also considers the best way to incorporate, uh, the best ways to incorporate non-traditional workers movements, community supporters and sympathetic allies while keeping a solid focus on pushing the demands of unionized workers at their places of work. So that's just a little bit of background on Steve. Um, for Gerald, he is a uh, professor, a historian, uh, author of many books, including recently The Counter-Revolution of 1776, Slave Resistance and the Origins of the United States of America, which looks at the ways the founders were fighting their revolution largely to preserve the system of slavery, which was important to key sectors of the colonial economy in both South and North. He has written about labor in Hawaii with his book, Fighting in Paradise, which we have out there, uh, Labor Unions, Racism, and Communists in the Making of Modern Hawaii. This book covers the rise of the ILWU, the struggle to organize across ethnic lines and along class lines in order to overturn what was essentially an apartheid system in Hawaii. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Steve Early and we can begin. Okay, I got it wrong. So Gerald's going to go first. Gerald has more seniority than I do. Okay. Hawaii, so. <laughs> well, first of all, thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be back here. I did a lot of research here for writing these two books that I did on this region. And I'm trying to think of a third book just so I'll have an opportunity and excuse to come back. So I'm going to provide remarks basically on the question of race and class first of all with regard to Hawaii, second of all with regard to the United States, and try to make some suggestions as to how we move forward. Now how, how did an apartheid state of the 1930s, that is to say Hawaii, become the most uh, progressive land under the US flag by the 1950s and a continuing citadel of left-leaning politics of today? Understanding how this occurred should give us insight into how to navigate the choppy waters of today and tomorrow. The short answer is that we owe thanks to the diligent leadership of the ILWU, particularly the leadership of Harry Bridges, a well-born in Melbourne, Australia, who migrated to the mainland of North America, founded this militant union by dint of uh, spearheading a general strike in San Francisco in 1934, and then Arford Lee Dodge repeated attempts to jail him for lengthy terms and or deport him on the grounds that he was a card-carrying <laughs> member of the Communist Party. Of course, he had help not only in the form of other ILWU leaders like Lou Goldblatt, Jack Hall, but also radical intellectuals who too were close to the Communist Party, including Koji Ariyoshi and Frank Marshall Davis. The latter, you may recall, is mentioned prominently in Barack Obama's memoir, and thus has ignited all manner of wild right-wing rumors about an alleged Manchurian candidate in the White House. These individuals could not have accomplished what they did without the militant self-assertion of thousands of workers of indigenous, uh, Japanese, uh, Filipino, Chinese, Puerto Rican, and African ancestries in particular. Now my remarks today will seek to build upon the lessons of history in order to suggest a way forward for labor today. Uh, one lesson of history that must be understood is that the atrocious working conditions that existed particularly on sugar and pineapple plantations was in many ways an outgrowth of an attempt to establish a kind of slavery in this archipelago after the United States Civil War ended in 1865. Now that's detailed in my book, uh, The White Pacific, 
That is to say, after 1865, slave traders from the mainland, after being defeated in the US Civil War, migrated to this region and began kidnapping Melanesians and Polynesians in an illicit commerce known as blackbirding, then dragging them to Fiji and Queensland, Australia as bonded laborers. Naturally, this was objected to strenuously by the Hawaiian Kingdom, which sought on the one hand to forge a confederation of South Sea Islands in order to fight back against this menace, and on the other hand sought to forge diplomatic alliances, uh, not least with Britain and Japan, uh, look at the Hawaiian flag, for example, and to a degree Germany, in order to forestall what occurred in the 1890s. That is to say, an illegal takeover by a then growing US imperialism involving the overthrow of the kingdom amidst phony charges that the aforementioned South Seas Confederation was an attempt to establish indigenous Hawaiian supremacy. Of course, this was just a cover for the actual establishment of white supremacy, or Holly supremacy, a system of brutally enforced apartheid that survived the questionable incorporation of Hawaii as the 50th and presumed final uh, US state. Now, fortunately, it's widely understood that the overthrow of indigenous Hawaiian rule was a crime against humanity. It is less well understood that labor and the left should be in the forefront of this movement backing self-determination, not only in Hawaii, but also on the mainland. Uh, we should demand that our just cry for self-determination for the indigenous should not be dealt with by the Department of Interior, but instead by the State Department. The weakness of the mainland left in embracing self-determination for Hawaii is akin to how the US left has been slow to realize that instead of being a, a great leap forward for humanity, instead, as argued in my book that was mentioned on 1776, the founding of the United States was actually a great leap forward for slavery, the African slave trade, and white supremacy. Uh, after 1776, for example, the United States replaced Britain as the global kingpin of slave trading particularly dragging Africans to Cuba and Brazil. Uh, the reason those two nations have so many dark-skinned people is largely because of the manic energy of US slave dealers. And besides, the United States was based upon this militarized form of identity politics, uh, the construction of whiteness. That is to say that how, it was, how was it that those who were warring on the shores of Europe, uh, English versus Irish, French versus British, Russian versus German, et cetera, somehow are transmuted into this new identity known as whiteness upon crossing the Atlantic then the Pacific. Now, it's true that the formation of the United States was a step forward insofar as it represented a blow against monarchy, but it was a step backward insofar as it represented the supplanting of European religious conflict, Protestant versus Catholic, Christian versus Jew and Mus Muslim, with racial conflict. That is to say, with Africans and the indigenous as prime targets to be ground into dust. The experience of the indigenous people of Hawaii was magnified on the mainland. Consider the Cherokee of Georgia, for example. They chose to assimilate, adopting Euro-American modes of dress, deserting hunter gathering for farming, which included enslavement of Africans, to show you how they were trying to assimilate. But approximately 200 years ago, they were expelled from their, their land, nonetheless, in what is now Georgia. And Europeans, fresh off the boat, were allotted what had been their land. A labor and the left have episodically addressed this outrage, but as I noted in my book on 1776, there's a debate in Australia, encapsulated in the term uh, history wars, where labor and the left in Australia have sought to interrogate the brutal implantation of white supremacy and dispossession of the indigenous in Australia. Instead, in the United States, labor and the left have not engaged in such history wars. Instead, they've hailed the proclamation of civil liberties is embodied in the Bill of Rights in a one-sided manner, up to and including hailing slave owners like uh, Thomas Jefferson, without seeming to recognize that number one, these civil liberties were just paper declarations into well in the 20th century, as suggested by anti-Catholic bigotry in the face of the First Amendment. And two, as I note in my 1776 book, these civil liberties were paper promises intended to lure and entice European migrants so that growing numbers of Africans delivered by the slave trade, and as well as the indigenous, could be over outnumbered and overawed. In other words, these rights were intended to solidify so-called white or so-called holly identity politics and were not meant to apply to the rest of us, as evidenced by the fact that the exercise of the death penalty and police killings and incarceration even today 
are disproportionately allocated to peoples of color, particularly black people. Minimally, if labor and the left intend to persist in their generous and sympathetic understanding of the travails <coughs> of slaveholding the apartheid state, they should at least be fair and balanced and extend such generous understanding to the travails of socialist experiments. Rather than capitulating to conservatism and painting all of these experiments with the broad brush of, quote, Stalinism, unquote. For we need to recognize that it's on, not only that we in the United States who are faced with a rising tide of right-wing populism that's very dangerous. In France, the neo-Nazi uh, National Front did quite well in the May uh, parliamentary elections and bids fair to defeat the socialist President uh, Francois Hollande in the next presidential elections. Uh, though the left prevailed in the recent Swedish elections, just this in the last few days, the ultra-right did tremendously well. Uh, Right-wing nationalists like Shinzo Abe in Japan, in Japan and Nahendra Modi in India are part of this trend too. Labor and the left need an explanation for this global trend of a rightward shift in order to understand its local manifestations. And when that analysis is done, I dare say that one explanation will be that the decline of the socialist camp weakened the left globally, contrary to what was thought at the time. A scarecrow is a poor excuse for a human being, but if it is removed, I dare say that one's crops will be plundered by scavengers. The socialist camp had admitted flaws and weaknesses, but with its decline, our crops have been devastated by our class antagonists. Labor. Labor and the left need to realize that one lesson of the past few decades is that progressivism will find it difficult to survive unless radicalism is strong. And if radicalism is weak, progressivism is weak. Labor and the left need to confront frontally the point that this nation was built on white supremacy, that workers defined as, quote, white, unquote, were oftentimes given advantages over those who were not in terms of admissions to public universities, for example, from which most peoples of color were excluded until well into the 20th century. The classic example is Pete Gray, the one-armed outfielder for the old St. Louis Browns baseball team, hired during World War II while more competent athletes of color were excluded. When baseball was desegregated after World War II, it became more difficult for the likes of Pete Gray to get a job in the outfield, and we need to understand that phenomenon and speak to that. When those defined as, quote, white or, quote, holly, a rioted when schools were desegregated in Little Rock, Arkansas in 1957 or Boston in 1977 with busing, we need to understand that in the real sense, they were rebelling against the fact that their perceived privileges were now eroding. Even today, when those defined as white voted at a rate of 60% for the Republican Party nationally in 2012, 90% in Dixie, they're yearning for a past whereby they had a special relationship with the US ruling class. Even today, though that special relationship has been eroded and challenged, the perception remains that the US ruling elite will somehow protect them against competition from the rest of us. That is to say, Pete Gray will be chosen over Jackie Robinson. When the majority of Euro-American voters in Louisiana voted for an avowed Nazi for governor in 1991, this pro-Nazi majority were voting to turn back the clock to an earlier era of white or holly supremacy, and we should not comfort ourselves with the delusion that those days are gone forever, particularly when labor and the left have kept quiet about the premises of the past. Instead of ignoring this phenomenon, which is the current posture of too many in labor and on the left, this phenomenon needs to be addressed openly for to the extent that voter suppression of anti-conservative voters prevails in 2014 and 2016, this nation faces the prospect of a real resurgence of the right, which would include privatizing of social security, shredding of labor law protections, destruction of women's reproductive freedom rights, abolition of affirmative action, and other horrors too ghastly to mention. More to the point, we need a better explanation than that which we have received as to why it is that Republican Governor Scott Walker of Wisconsin was not recalled by the electorate a few years ago after eviscerating collective bargaining rights with a good deal of the Euro-American working class and middle class standing with the GOP. We need a better explanation of why it is that when Volkswagen in Tennessee, unlike most US employers, decided it would not fight an effort by the United Auto Workers to unionize a plant, 
a decision that was denounced by the GOP leadership in that state. But then the workers voted against union representation, even though management uh, said that it would not resist. In short, in order to confront what I am speaking of, we need to understand how and why it was that Hawaii and the US retreated from apartheid. Yes, a good deal of credit, as I already said, can be laid at the doorstep of the ILWU on this island and the forces ar arrayed around Martin Luther King Jr. on the mainland. But we should also recognize that to a significant degree, there was enormous global pressure on the United States to retreat from apartheid. Thus, under global pressure, the US ruling class broke their pact with the Holly working class and middle class and moved haltingly away from apartheid, thereby incurring their wrath, leading to riots in Little Rock, Boston, and elsewhere, not to mention a riot at the ballot box, leading to Richard Nixon's Southern strategy and the evolution of the Republican Party of today as a virtually all white, all Holly party on the mainland. I don't know about Hawaii. <laughs> but this was a strategy, <laughs> sorry? But this was a strategy akin to the counterinsurgency in Guatemala in the 1970s that set back the left. It was frijoles y fusiles. It was beans and rifles. It was concessions to our movement and takeaways from our movement. Uh, such a left-right strategy of the US ruling class left many of our leaders befuddled, especially when the tallest trees in our forest, leaders like Harry Bridges and the great Paul Robeson, were fighting off prison terms. For as re apartheid retreated in the 1950s, labor and the left were pulverized. That is to say, concessions with regard to anti-apartheid and takeaways with regard to class and shrinking wages and terrible working con conditions. And someday, in some ways, we received concessions on the race front that were then eroded on the class front. Certain constitutional protections were extended to us on paper while our paychecks shriveled. As you know, in 1959, when Hawaii became a state, the United States, as noted, was an apartheid nation. In fact, in 1960, the Cuban communist leader Blas Roca, then in a tense standoff with US imperialism, charged correctly that Africans under the US flag were treated worse than any other Africans in the hemisphere. This was due to the un undue influence in Washington of Democrats who objected to wa Hawaii becoming a state not because of the illegal takeover in the 1890s, but for fear that Hawaii would elect to a Congress legislators of Asian Pacific origin who would not back apartheid, which was true. Patsy Mink and Daniel Inouye, for example, became reliable supporters of anti-racist legislation helping to sound the death knell for US-style apartheid. Unfortunately, the aforementioned left heroes then under assault on anti-communist grounds did not sufficiently recognize that just because Dixiecrats objected to incorporation of Hawaii as a state. This was an insufficient reason to endorse Hawaii as a state. F still, the fact remains, as noted, that the left, including the Communist Party and the ILWU, were under vicious siege in this archipelago in the 1950s. The leadership of the ILWU was placed on trial, charged in the, under the Smith Act with being dupes of Moscow and slated for long prison terms. However, because Hawaii was the most progressive jurisdiction under the US flag, Unlike the mainland, where left-led unions were destroyed and communist leaders jailed, here, thousands of workers marched and protested in a valiant display of courage, which is one of the reasons why Hawaii continues to outstrip the mainland in terms of basic civil liberties and civil rights protections. We now know that this anti-communist upsurge during the Cold War planted the seeds of what we face today. In other words, US imperialism overdetermined Moscow, which is what it's doing today. And about four decades ago, President Richard M. Nixon journeyed to China, ushering in an attempt with Beijing on anti-Soviet grounds, which set the stage not just for the Chinese attack on Vietnam a few years later, and the Beijing-Washington collaboration that led to genocide in Cambodia, then punishment of Vietnam for ousting the murderous Khmer Rouge, <clears throat> but also massive uh, inward direct foreign investment into China to the point for a few years ago, the well-known British intellectual Martin Jacques published a book entitled, When China Rules the World. A review of mine of this book can be found online. Indeed, the late University of Chicago Nobel laureate in economics, Robert Fogel, predicted just before his recent death that within, within decades, the Chinese economy would be 10, time, 10 times the size of the US economy. On 
30th of April 2014, the Financial Times of London predicted that by the end of this year, the Chinese economy would be substantially larger than that of the United States. And just today, Alibaba, the Chinese version of Facebook, excuse me, Amazon, eBay, and PayPal just had an IPO, and it's an initial public offering on Wall Street, raising billions of dollars and thrusting it just today into the front ranks of internet giants. Now, all this global trend has enormous consequences for the white supremacy that has underpinned the United States, not to mention the fact that as we celebrate the centennial of World War I, that status quo powers like the United States have had historic difficulties in handling rising powers like China, just as in 1914, status quo Britain had difficulty in handling a rising Germany. Already there are disturbing signs of potential conflict between the two, not only the fact that in recent days U.S. airplanes have been buzzing the coast of China. Recall what happened in the spring of 2001 when a U.S. plane was downed by China near, Hai, near Hainan, leading to a tense standoff. Then there's the ongoing conflict between Tokyo and Beijing, which has reached almost operatic levels. Not to mention China's conflicts with the Philippines and Vietnam, all of which could have repercussions for this archipelago, just like World War II did, which contains so many this archipelago, which contains so many of Chinese and Japanese and Filipino and Vietnamese and Holly descent. Of late, Australia, whose economy has been heavily dependent <coughs> on Chinese development, has been rocked by the spectacle of a leading member of the governing conservative coalition referring to Chinese in blatantly racist terms, evoking memories of Australia's reaction to a rising Japan in the 1930s. And sadly, we all know how that worked out in the 1940s. Uh, what happened is that the billionaire turned legislator Clive Palmer in a stunning TV interview referred to Chinese as, quote, mongrels and bastards. This was in the context of Palmer being accused of taking more than 12 million uh, dollar, Australian dollars. This is in the context uh, of the point that for five consecutive years, uh, China has remained Australia's biggest trading partner, biggest market of ex exports, and biggest source of imports. Now, this leads to my first recommendation. The labor movement in Hawaii should sponsor an Asia-Pacific meeting of labor unions inviting Chinese, Japanese, mainland, Vietnamese, Filipino, and Australian unions in order to forge a common peace agenda, a common labor agenda. This could be done in conjunction with the APEC meeting, uh, Asia-Pacific uh, meeting in China in November, and the G20 meeting in Brisbane, Australia that same month, or it could, of course you could take more time and organize it next year. Indeed, uh, Hawaiian labor needs to be in the vanguard of bringing U.S. labor into dialogue with Asian Pacific labor. Labor in Hawaii during the heyday of Jack Hall and Koji Ariyoshi and Frank Marshall Davis was in the forefront of a global trend where unions took the view that their interests were not only wages and working conditions, but virtually everything under the sun, foreign policy not least, recognizing that what could be won at the bargaining table could easily be lost in the legislature or on the battlefield of war, such as when our tax dollars were sucked into bloody fiascos of war in Korea and Vietnam and Iraq and Afghanistan and Libya and presumably now Syria. Today is a particularly inopportune moment for this tendency when recent reports tell us that despite the supposed acceleration of job growth in the US, women are falling behind. Office and administrative jobs, which historically have been largely staffed by women, were eliminated in the downturn. And of the nearly two, two million such jobs cut, about 20% have returned in the past two years. Women also were disproportionately affected by about 800,000 government job cuts from about 2010 to 2013. And only a small portion of those have come back as Republican barbarians continue their maniacal attacks on the public sector under the irrational Reagan-era slogan that government is the problem. Substituting human labor with technology is also possibly a reason why women's office jobs are being eliminated. The spread of technology without government spending on job training and retraining bids fair to create a living nightmare for labor. One sees this in the spread of robotization, which has gained traction already in the Japanese economy and is increasingly gaining traction in the US economy. <clears throat> a keen example of the spread of technology is glimpsed by peeking at what is going on with the taxi industry. My dad used to drive a taxi, so I've always taken a keen interest in this position. 
The average annual wage for a cab driver in the United States today is a meager $22,000 a year, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. But that paltry figure is slated to go down even further with the spread of technology companies like Uber and Lyft, which allows one to summon a driver, often a laid off housewife driving a Toyota, via a smartphone app through the internet. These tech companies are spread to 200 cities around the world and are driving <coughs> many taxi drivers to the unemployment lines. They say they're creating 20,000 new driver jobs per month, but this is dubious propaganda at best. Right now they are undercharging taxis, sometimes as much as 30%, but I dare say that once they drive taxis out of business, fares will soar promptly. This laid off housewife is told by Uber and Lyft that they can take home 80% of what they take in in fares. But there are so many hidden charges that some of these new high-tech drivers are making less money than taxi drivers and working longer hours. Recently, about 100 Uber drivers in Seattle quit in protest. Though the GOP is supposedly family friendly and the party of family values, the fact is that though even nations like China offer maternity leave to workers, the so-called sole remaining superpower does not have a mandatory federal policy for any paid maternal leave. What is worse, the United States stands along Liberia, Papua New Guinea, and Swaziland as the only four nations in the world that have no national law mandating paid time off for new parents. Then there's the question of the minimum wage. We should all salute SEIU, Service Employees International Union, for their demonstrations in 150 cities a few weeks ago demanding a $15 per hour minimum wage. You may recall that Seattle voted to have a similar minimum wage, even though before that vote, bosses were whining and whinging about how this $15 per hour minimum wage would bring gloom and doom, if not the collapse of civilization as we know it. But of course, that hasn't happened. Uh, local bosses, particularly the administrators of the University of Hawaii, should note the example set by the president of Kentucky State University, who took a pay cut in order that raises might be allocated <coughs> to his lowest paid workers. That is an example that should be followed by those Waikiki hotel barons, big law firms and construction companies, not to mention the plantations, among others. This leads me to my second recommendation. Hawaii, since the 1940s, has been in the vanguard of labor on the left, a place where the CIO union, this ILWU, was not routed, a place where Smith Act trials of communist leaders were unsuccessful, unlike the mainland. Today, Hawaii should resume its vanguard role, not just in the movement to bring a $15 per hour minimum wage. Since the bosses are going to complain anyway, I think Hawaii, given the high prices here and the fact that so much has to be imported, should be demanding $20 an hour minimum wage. $25 an hour. <laughs> that is my charge to Hawaii labor. <coughs> You've been in the vanguard since the 1930s when the ILWU arrived on these shores. You should be in the forefront of demanding self-determination for this archipelago. You should be convening an international conference featuring labor from China, Japan, Vietnam, the Philippines, and the mainland. And you should be demanding at least a $20 an hour minimum wage for local workers. Thank you. Wow, that was quite a to-do list. I didn't see people writing all that down. You must have good memories. All right, good. I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. What a tremendous Labor Fest uh, turnout. Uh, I'm like uh, uh, Gerald, who's been here many times. And it's my first time, and wow. so I'm still in... Hawaii tourist culture shock, <laughs> but I've been trying to uh, read up a bit on the history of your uh, great state. Um, and uh, I want to thank, you know, Leslie and Dave for making this trip possible, for thanking my old CWA comrade, uh, Joe Burns, for putting me in touch with Leslie and Dave. How many people were here to hear Joe Burns uh, talk about his book about reviving the strike last year? Show of hands. Okay, so we got some Joe Burns fans here. Joe, as some of you know, um, is still doing what I used to do. He's a full-time national staff member of the Communication Workers of America, working for its uh, airline division. And he's out there negotiating with US Air and American Airlines. Uh, a lot of big companies like that. Well, we just had a tremendous organizing victory this week, one of the largest uh, union representation wins 
uh, campaign conducted jointly uh, with the Teamsters involving 15,000 passenger service employees, American Airlines and, and, uh, and US Air uh, back on the mainland. So before we get into some of the bad news, let's have a little good news about one of the biggest union organizing victories of, of the year. Uh, I was a CWA rep, an organizer, national staff member for close to 30 years, and like many people in this room, uh, was quite uh, busy every day uh, helping workers with contract negotiations and grievance handling, uh, training programs for stewards, uh, with organizing, with uh, political action and, and legislative work, uh, with some international affairs. And I think Gerald's uh, proposal is a really important one. Uh, some of the work that I was able to do with CWA and the telecom industry involved invaluable uh, trade union allies in Western Europe, Canada, uh, and some of the other countries uh, around the globe where workers have very much in common uh, now dealing with multinational firms uh, and facing many of the same threats to pass collective bargaining gains. Um, I retired my full-time job about five or six years ago. I'm still active in the union, and I'm very proud that a member of my new CWA local, which is the Pacific Media Workers Guild, based in Northern California, with uh, members also in Hawaii, is uh, here tonight, Brother Derek Dupledge. Derek, uh, where are you? Uh, right in the back here, in the vice president. Uh, has a couple hundred members at the Star Advertiser and two papers in Maui. And uh, I am actually an elected representative of the freelancer section of the Pacific Media Workers Guild, but 100 uh, freelance journalists uh, in, the, in the Bay Area. Um, <clears throat> I never, uh, you know, I thought I would originally get a, a chance to come out here uh, way back in 1977. And I, I was working back then for a Teamster reform group that later became part of the Teamsters for Democratic Union. Anybody ever hear of TDU, which for, Last uh, close to 40 years, I've been fighting for union democracy and reform in, in the IBT. Uh, had its uh, high point in the 1970s, uh, rather 1990s, when a fellow named Ron Carey was uh, a reformer, was elected international president uh, in the first direct election of top officers in the Teamsters that was held in 1991. There's a little bit of the history of that uh, in this book. And anyway, I was working as a staff attorney and organizer for this uh, you know, dissident group in the Teamsters. We get a lot of calls from people complaining about union problems. And I uh, got a couple of calls from members of uh, Teamsters Local 996. Do we have any Teamsters in the house, uh, active, retired, 996 folks, past or, or present? Uh, anyway, back in the 70s, as uh, you, know, you can note from reading uh, Gerald's wonderful book, the big man in the Teamsters out here was a fellow named Art Rutledge. And these rank and filers were not happy with Art. Um, <clears throat> they couldn't figure out how somebody could be the head of both the Teamsters local and a hotel workers local and be buying a hotel, <laughs> running the union like a family business. We all know where that led uh, two or three generations later. We've been following the, uh, the frolics and, and uh, uh, legal problems of the Rutledge uh, Plan in recent years, um, there was a lot of problems with multiple salaries when you are simultaneously the head <laughs> of two different unions. Anyway, it sounded a lot like the operation run by a, a then notorious uh, teamster by the name of Jackie Presser in Cleveland, mm. who had a similar double-breasted operation. He's the head of the hotel workers, he's the head of the teamsters, he's a businessman, he's a friend of businessman. <laughs> Not much time for taking care of the workers' interests. Anyway, um, I bring that up because I think uh, uh, you know, the strength of Gerald's book is it shows the impact in one state, your state, uh, of uh, left-wing labor militancy as personified by Longshore in its, in its heyday. Uh, and, but there's always been another strain in the labor movement, a more conservative, more traditional kind of business union tendency uh, back in the 50s and 60s, exemplified by the many of the unions, like Brother Rutledge's, that were associated with the American Federation of Labor. And um, somehow here, you know, both strands of the labor movement, the more progressive wing, the more conservative wing, managed to produce an exceptional oasis of, of, uh, of organized labor strength and vitality uh, and stability. Um, now, I know there's a lot of people in this room who probably feel They've got as many problems as a trade unionist as you know the other 16 million back on the 
on the mainland. But um, you know, I was just looking at these statistics about union density in this wonderful little history, your great state and the Center for Labor Education and Research, and it is astounding, right, that Hawaii is still number three uh, among all of the states, only a little bit behind New York and uh, Alaska uh, in terms of levels of union membership. 22% last year, you know, where the rest of the labor movement uh, overall is down to about 11%, uh, under 7% in the private sector. Uh, obviously, there's been some fall off from 30%, you know, 25 years ago. Uh, but, you know, you look at these numbers, uh, membership, uh, the percentage of the workforce, even the number of members of workers who are represented by Hawaiian unions, uh, uh, who are, you know, freeloaders or agency pay payers, very small compared to any other state that, that I'm familiar with. So, um, you know, to give you a, uh, uh, a tourist perspective, uh, and I'm sure the labor movement has a lot of problems that we're going to be talking about here locally tonight, uh, you still live in a kind of paradise. And uh, I think the, the threat that you face uh, from across the ocean is the trends uh, that have led in some very different directions uh, in the other uh, 40 or more states um, that are not in this uh, same top of the league category in terms of, of union membership and uh, and influence and density and, and so forth. Um, let, me, let me just say that one of the things I try to get at in this book is, and it has, I think, a certain amount of historical resonance with uh, Gerald's work, is the continuing tension between this kind of conservative business union approach, which basically says today we're under attack by the employers, by the politicians. Uh, really, the only way we can survive is through a strategy of accommodation. Uh, negotiating uh, concessions, uh, getting involved in labor management, collaboration, and partnership schemes. Um, you know, there's another wing of the labor movement, smaller, that says, no, you know, we have to mobilize our members, we have to fight back, we cannot give back decades and decades of uh, wage and benefit gains, you know, improve working conditions, uh, rights on the job that people have fought and died for. And you know, to win these kinds of struggles, whether we're teachers, whether we're nurses, whether we're airline workers, telephone workers, whatever we do, we have to build alliances with the people we serve. You know, our patients, the taxpayers who uh, pay our salaries, uh, the parents of the kids we teach, um, you know, the broader public. Uh, and those kinds of partnerships, those kinds of relationships are a hell of a lot more important than buddying up with our bosses, who, historically speaking, have always been unreliable partners. Uh, <laughs> just waiting for the back to be turned, <laughs> uh, for the relationships, you know, to change. And in the book, and it's you know a kind of painful uh, uh, reading, I think. Uh, you know that conflict today is played out, both here in Hawaii and uh, particularly in California. Uh, between uh, the more militant wing of the labor movement and the more accommodationist business union wing of the labor movement within Kaiser Permanente. Major employer here. Labor's HMO, embraced by the AFL-CIO as a model employer, one that the rest of the healthcare industry should aspire to emulate. And, you know, you have a whole coalition of Change to Win and AFL-CIO unions that are part of a rather elaborate, nearly 20-year-old uh, bargaining coalition, which is a good thing. Unions should be bargaining together. But it, uh, their bargaining and their contract enforcement activities, and their, their relationship with the employer, all plays out within the context of a labor management partnership, uh, which has really... Uh, forged a kind of union, unionism at Kaiser that is very troubling. Outside the partnership, <coughs> representing 25,000 workers, including 2,000 uh, here in Hawaii, some of whom are here tonight, we're going to hear from them in a minute, you have the non-partnership unions. Um, 18,000 of them are members of the California Nurses Association. Um, for many years, an independent union, a breakaway from the American Nurses Association, in recent years, a, an AFL affiliate. Uh, a union that fought for first-in-the-nation nurse-patient staffing ratios in California, uh, a standard for the healthcare industry that no other state has yet to uh, attain. Um, 
We have uh, 18,000 CNA represented nurses in just about to start bargaining with Kaiser right now and a real possibility of a major strike because of Kaiser seeking the same sort of, uh, of benefit givebacks that it has been trying to extract from 2,000 HRE local five members here in Hawaii for uh, the last two years or more. Now we have about 5,000 members of a union that I write a lot about in this book, the new National Union of Healthcare Workers, who've gone three years without first contract at Kaiser after exercising their right to switch from SEIU to what they felt was a more militant, democratic, more member responsive union. And what you see here is an awful spectacle. An employer that is held up by the AFL CIO as a model, uh, basically, and, and a hugely profitable company. It's made uh, uh, more than uh, $13 billion in profits uh, since 2009, is on track to earn about $5 billion in profits this year based on its first two quarters, seeking contract concessions you know, from portions of one of the most heavily unionized uh, healthcare system workforces in the country. What is wrong with that picture? The AFL-CIO convention last fall in uh, uh, Los Angeles, Rich Trumka and the rest of the leadership had invited Kaiser to come and make a presentation to the delegates about its corporate wellness program, which we can talk more about. It's a, a, a trend in healthcare cost shifting that I'm not particularly fond of, it's described in the book, which CNA and NUHW have been uh, very critical of. Uh, it took a threat of picketing by California nurses and NUHW members for the AFL at the last minute to pull its invitation to Kaiser, uh, an employer with major outstanding contract disputes from getting uh, the red carpet welcome at the AFL-CIO convention. Two of the largest four anti-concession strikes anywhere in the US since 2011 have been where? At Kaiser. More than 20,000 workers went out for a day or more in 2011. Uh, members of CNA, NUHW, and the second time, the operating engineers, all to resist concessions that Kaiser is pushing on the non-partnership unions. Uh, here to, tonight to just say a few words, and we can hopefully hear from them more in the Q&A session, are a bunch of local two members from Kaiser. Would you guys stand up and be recognized? Are you all sitting together or separately? Please stand up if we could. Um, I just want to say that this struggle that they're engaged in, which I know many of you probably already have supported uh, in many different ways, is really critical. Um, uh, uh, Sister Gloria Allen is going to say a few words more about it uh, in a moment. But, uh, you know, there's, there's two fights for 15 going on out there. There's the one that we're all, you know, cheering about. You know, let's raise the floor for the most oppressed, the lowest paid workers, let's win wage increases for them through city, state, maybe eventually federal action or through contract bargaining. But the other more worrisome fight for 15 is the employer's fight for 15. And that is the fight to drive the pay of people who now make 20 or 25 or $30 an hour at Boeing, at Verizon, at Kaiser, companies making billions of dollars down to a $15 an hour level through wage and benefit and, and work rule takeaways. So, uh, Sister Gloria, who's worked at Kaiser for 20 years, you want to say a little bit about the state of your struggle and uh, how people can help? Well, our, our struggle is like everybody else. I mean, everybody has struggles. Um, and in this room, I see a lot of uh, people like me, or some maybe younger than I, as baby boomers. Uh, the struggle that we're having right now is one of the big things that we're trying to save and we need your help is to save our pension. We work very hard. Everybody gives a wow experience to our patients. We love our patients so dearly that we make Kaiser what they are today. And you too, if you're a patient of Kaiser, you make them number one. To me, it's like awesome. But to, to give back, they're not giving back. They want to take away. So we got to save what we have because all of us 
need that pension, right? You cannot just survive on what we have now. So right now we are in a struggle and we spent two years without a contract and we feel and we're thinking positive, we're gonna have to get what we want. And, and we need all you uh, support to, to, to see us and um, to be with us if you can come to us. We don't know what we're gonna do, but we're gonna have in October 7th, we're gonna have a negotiation and we'll see where, what happens on the table. And so right now, um, as we are trying to let our people know about the pension, don't be a sucker to lose our pension. And that's what it is. Yeah, because getting old shouldn't hurt, right? And, I, and I'm one of them, right? Come on, just be proud. Don't get old. <laughs> Sisters and brothers for coming. Uh, 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 Brother uh, Eric Gill has been good enough to invite me to come to one day of your two-day convention next week and to meet with Kaiser folks and hopefully do a write-up about it uh, based on a meeting on Monday for labor notes. People are not subscribers. There's some free copies out on the table outside, 35-year-old uh, labor newspaper and education project. Um, this really, really is an important struggle and uh, you know, it goes to the heart of what is the appropriate relationship of a union to an employer. Uh, the, the, the new National Union of Healthcare Workers uh, not being bound by partnership rules has been a major uh, patient safety advocate uh, for Kaiser Patients California. Just got the state of California to impose a $4 million fine on Kaiser for its uh, mental health care deficiencies. Um, you know, generated a lot of publicity of its, uh, as part of its attempt to uh, get first contracts for mental health workers. Uh, the NUHW has knocked two Kaiser board members off the board uh, as a result of uh, their corporate campaign and contract struggle activity. I think you're going after one that's uh, based out here. And uh, this kind of work uh, is tough. But when you're presented, I think, with a so-called last, best, and final offer like you got in January, no retroactive pay, do away with defined benefit pensions for any new hires, uh, you know, minimal wage increases, companies making billions of dollars. If we agreed, sign on the dotted line to those kinds of concessions with a company like Kaiser, what do we say to a troubled employer, right? To e in either the public or the private sector. All right, so let me just say um, a couple more quick things so we you know, have time for, for questions and discussions. Um, you know, the Kaiser struggle, uh, uh, really also is tied into the whole, you know, challenge of labor grappling with the, the negative fallout of the Affordable Care Act. Um, you know, the HRE, to its credit, has been one of the, I think, most uh, uh, articulate union critics of, of uh, the downside of Obamacare. I would recommend that everybody get one of these making inequality worse studies that the HRE nationally has done. This was much debated at the AFL-CIO convention last fall. We talk about it a lot in the book. Uh, Brother Steve Kemble, who is here somewhere tonight from Physicians for a National Health Program, just got back from a meeting of 300 single-payer activists from unions all across the country in Oakland last month. And the, the, the failings of the ACA, so obvious already, the fact that it has had, if anything, a negative impact on union bargaining and certainly on multi-employer uh, healthcare trust is uh, generating renewed interest in Medicare for all, state level, wherever we can get it. Single payer campaign has new wind in sales, and this is certainly one way that we can all respond, not just at the bargaining table uh, in the fight against healthcare cost shifting, but in the political arena as well. Um, let me just say that, uh, you know, I think we need a new labor politics, that's obvious. Uh, Le uh, Gerald's point that, you know, if you don't have a kind of a radical poll, kind of pulling the more moderate, more liberal Democratic Party types in your direction, um, you don't get a lot of traction around workers' rights issues. Uh, one of the promising things to me, running around the country uh, talking about this book, is that there are stirrings of very inspiring labor-based independent political action, a lot of different cities, mainly at the city level. Uh, Gerald mentioned uh, Shama Sawant's uh, amazing uh, uh, victory election as the first socialist city council member in Seattle in 100 years. Been a while there. 
you know, she's a community college teacher, an adjunct, a union member, and built her whole electoral campaign, as Gerald said, around the fight for 15, really goosed SEIU along a little bit in the right direction in Seattle and perhaps elsewhere. In New Haven, we've got an HERE, an AFSCME back group called New Haven Rising, has elected a majority of the city council, our rank and file union activists. Um, people who no longer want to rely on Democrats to speak for labor. Too often a disappointment uh, waiting to happen. They recruited union members to run for office. Same thing happened recently out in Lorain, Ohio. Jackson, Mississippi, probably reading about that. We have an independent political movement there that elected the late mayor uh, and, and continues after his death. Where I live now in California, in Richmond, California, we have a group called the Richmond Progressive Alliance. Uh, Dan Siegel, a longtime radical labor lawyer, is running for mayor. Everybody who's spent years in the labor movement, it looks like, is now running for office. And guess what? Some people are actually getting elected with support from their fellow union members. So we need uh, a little bit more of that. Let me just close, and it may be a very far away example, but you know, we're talking about global perspectives here. How many people in this room have ever been to the great state of Vermont? Oh really? God. So the few. tourists come here, and when you want to go on vacation, you go to Vermont, <laughs> all right? <laughs> You're keeping the economy of Vermont alive. Um, I have a whole section about the great state of Vermont because it was part of my turf as a union rep. Uh, we had a bunch of Verizon workers there that I worked with for years until their company was sold, like Hawaii Telecom was here, to uh, a successor employer. It was a disaster for the workers. Uh, Verizon actually began that pattern here in Hawaii and then took it to northern New England and, and West Virginia. You know, Vermont really is a case study, as I try to argue in the book, for building a progressive third party alternative over a long period of time from the bottom up in a way that's radical but pragmatic and effective. Um, you know, the political space there has been created to a large degree by a now would-be presidential candidate, Brother Bernie Sanders. Any Bernie Sanders fans here? Yeah. You might have seen him on Meet the Press. Bernie Sanders, the only socialist in the Senate, the only socialist, you know, there were a few others in, in Congress for many years, uh, on Meet the Press. I mean, this running for president thing gets you the mic. Uh, John McCain, just to put this in perspective, has apparently been on Meet the Press 97 times in the last five years. This was Bernie's first. Anyway, Bernie's great contribution to the you know, progressive movement of Vermont was to foster a, a progressive party, now has seven or eight uh, uh, representatives uh, in the state legislature, people on the Burlington City Council, largest city uh, body of that sort, selected mayors. Uh, there's a whole viable third party that has succeeded in pulling the Democrats to the left, and that's why you now actually have a fighting chance to have something resembling, hopefully in the next few years, a single-payer health care system in a single state. Uh, wouldn't have happened without Bernie's relentless campaigning for it and the tremendous work of the Vermont Progressive Party that I, I tried to describe. And, and in many ways, you know, the, the history of Vermont, as different as it is, uh, you know, from the history of Hawaii, you know, it's not majority minority, it's majority majority to the 98th percentile. Can't find a more white landlocked state, about half the size of yours. They got one congressman, not two. But in the 1950s and through the 60s, the Republicans predominated. There was a little bit of pushback against McCarthyism by the Republican senator from the state. The key union in the state was very much like the ILWU. It was the United Electrical Workers, which into the 1970s, left-led independent union, was the largest union in Vermont, really had a quiet impact on its uh, politics. And uh, over the last uh, 20 years in particular, uh, AFSCME, my own union, the communication workers, the UE, uh, the teachers, both NEA and AFT, have really weaned themselves away from their often dysfunctional uh, relationship kind of productive support for the Democratic Party in a state where the Democrats are liberals for the most part, and embraced a third party, made it work, re-elected Bernie repeatedly. They're now cheering him on as he takes the show national. And uh, I think people you know, can study that example. It's a model that's not applicable everywhere, perhaps more in small states than bigger states, but you know, Perhaps you have the scale to pull it off as well. Thanks so much for having me, and glad to discuss any of the things we touched on or didn't. And